Hello and welcome to our new online series for controversies in rectal cancer. This collection of video content will allow us to explore some of those difficult decisions that our multidisciplinary team sometimes have to make for these patients. You'll be able to watch renowned clinicians in the field giving lectures on controversial topics, watch our expert MDT panel discussing complex cases, and see some uh, commentary and uh, critical analysis uh, from other clinicians. Each episode will have a common theme running through the broadcast. In this episode, we're going to look at surviving beyond cancer. And Claire Taylor, a nurse consultant from St Mark's Hospital, is going to talk to us about this in a little bit more detail. I hope you enjoy watching. Hello, I'm Claire Taylor. I'm a mammal and nurse consultant and I specialise in colorectal cancer. Thank you for inviting me to give this lecture today. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Greg Wynne and the ICNE Centre have asked me to talk about rectal cancer survivorship, what are the priorities for the patient, and also how that might differ from the MDT. So today I'm going to think about the patient's perspective and what might matter most to them. We're then going to have a, a look at the cancer survivorship initiatives and how we've been working in the UK to improve the lives of those living with and beyond cancer. We need to think about the um, surveillance programmes and the aftercare uh, and addressing the commonest concerns that people may have. We're going to look at a couple of those and how, as uh, the MDT, we may be able to support people to live well with and beyond this cancer. The patient's perspective. So the majority of people now diagnosed with rectal cancer can be expected to live at least 10 years. A huge amount of progress has been made in uh, oncological outcomes. We need to make sure that the quality of life that people have after they've had their treatment is as good as it can possibly be. We also need to think about the age of which people may be having these treatments. Uh, many will be over 60 years or more and what that might mean in terms of where they're at in their life biography and the support that they may have around them, the comorbidity that they may also be managing and their ability to access appropriate health services. Also we need to think about the expectations that people may have as they are deciding about rectal cancer treatments and we need to make sure from the outset they're fully informed, they're fully engaged with the options and their increasing options are available and it isn't always straightforward. Evidence suggests that this patient group may be fairly passive in the decision making process and I think it's our job to make sure that we make the information accessible and we involve them as much as possible to help them to make the right decision for them. It's crucial in managing expectations that they are realistic because those whose expectations aren't, they may well have impaired uh, satisfaction and uh, reduced quality of life if they don't. A literature review by Young et al. in 2018 found that um, this patient group could have unrealistic expectations, particularly about the negative aspects of chemotherapy and having a stoma. And interestingly, there was a marked discord between the patient and the clinician's expectations of bowel function and, in particular, psychosocial outcomes. They also found that the younger patient population were more concerned about a quick return to work, res resumption of their social activities and an undisturbed sex life. Of course, these are generalisations and it's really critical to understand the individual patient's perspective, what's going to be important to them um, and what they're expecting to get out of that treatment. We, of course, know that most people are looking for a cancer cure and that will be their main uh, priority from getting through the treatment, but also a swift recovery from that. The Bossomer study, which was a group of looking at um, patients' perceptions of the likelihood of cure, indicated that 83% of patients felt surgery was likely, or very likely, to help with some of the problems they were currently experiencing as a result of their cancer. But what if it doesn't? So we need to help people to understand that they, it may well, but there may be other problems that come subsequently, and that we need to be there with them to help them manage those. So there that comes to assessment, um, making assessments before treatment so we can reduce cognitive dissonance uh, to uh, manage those expectations. Does what matter to that individual change over time? It may be that patients have an initial focus on their biological goals and the conventional treatment initially, but that might change over time. 
so it's important we do reassess. This can be a long and complex journey for some of these patients, of course. This will depend on the stage of their cancer and the treatment plan that's put together with them. Um, and the duration of the treatment may only be a few months, but for many with rectal cancer treatment, it can be well over a year. Another factor that would seem to be important in predicting patients' recovery trajectories is psychosocial support. A large study called the CRUISE study, which recruited across the UK from over 20 centres and 900 patients that tracked them following their diagnosis of colorectal cancer and treatment over five years, found that there were different recovery trajectories. And those who had the worst recovery were those who had the lowest levels of social support and also lowest levels of self-efficacy, this sense of belief in themselves to believe that they had the skills and resources to manage their recovery. So these are things that perhaps we should be assessing before treatment and trying to maximise the support that somebody has in the first uh, few weeks after the treatment. And of course, there's this interesting phenomenon called response shift. So in the aftermath of uh, rectal cancer treatment, and patients are managing symptoms, whether that be urinary, bowel, sexual dysfunction, pain, fatigue, um, peripheral neuropathy, that they start to manage those symptoms and they start to put up with them. Um, and there's also the possibility that the individual doesn't want to say to their treating team that they are coping with the consequences of treatment. They may feel very guilty about managing those uh, symptoms and feel that they should be grateful that they've been given curative treatment. But it may well be that although they are coping uh, with those conditions, there's still much that we could do to help. Before moving on to think about living with and beyond cancer and the history of how that's evolved in the UK. I just want to touch on the IMPACT programme because that's been um, looking at how we can improve the management of people who have more advanced rectal cancer. And as part of this initiative, there have been key stakeholder events, two of which were patient-centred. And these are patients with more advanced rectal cancer. And they have found that their top two priorities were spending more time with family and friends and minimising pain and discomfort. And interestingly, their lowest priority was not having a stoma. So those who are having complicated treatment regimes may well be repeatedly visiting the hospital, um, coming back for numerous appointments and feeling that time with family and friends is being taken from them. Um, and we make assumptions that for, for many that they don't want to have perhaps exentative surgery because they don't want to have uh, a stoma. So this uh, is interesting uh, challenge to that point. Those having um, chemotherapy plus uh, radiotherapy are going to be those who are likely to have the most consequences uh, and the, the uh, greatest amount of late and long-term effects. Um, and so it's with that realisation that the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative was um, developed to help people in managing um, these consequences and helping them to live well with, with and beyond cancer. The National Cancer Survivorship Initiative started in the UK in uh, 10 years ago actually now, with a collaboration of NHS Improvement, uh, Department of Health and Macmillan Cancer Support. It recognised that one in four people were living with the consequences of cancer treatment and that the number of people living with and beyond cancer was increasing. We tend to think of cancer survivorship as a stage after potentially curative treatment. The word uh, cancer survivor, the term, is going out of vogue now because patients don't generally relate to themselves as a cancer survivor. At what point do they become a survivor? Is that a connotation that suggests that they're coping well and when many don't feel that they are? Or is it that they have to reach the five-year point at which they may be told that the chances of recurrence disease are now very small? Um, so we tend to use the phrase living with the beyond cancer more now. Anyway, the NCSI, National Cancer Survivorship Initiative, uh, implemented various work streams. It, it, it showed the impact that cancer had on people's work lives, the huge financial hit, that, and also the um, need for rehabilitation services. Uh, a key outcome from it was a document 2012, Taking Action to Improve Outcomes, and it suggested that there should be a recovery package, a series of interventions to help people to recover after they've had their cancer treatment, and redesigning follow-up so that it could become a, a package of aftercare, not just around managing the disease, but managing the whole person. 
The book cover shown on the slide is called Lost in Translation by Hewitt, and it's describing a transition where people are moving from being a cancer patient to a cancer survivor, and how we might be able to help support people in that transition. You uh, may also have heard of Bowie's description of biographical disruption. For some people, they'll get through the treatment very well, they'll uh, come back to follow up and they seem to be doing all right, and then it may be a few months later that the reality of everything they've been through really hits them, and it's almost like their world stops, they don't really know how to move forward, they've been really shaken up by the diagnosis, and they can't see how they're going to integrate all of that to refine themselves and become this survivor. So what can we do, what behaviours, what processes can we put in place to help them with that transition? The recovery package is, is one of those, but there's more than that. I think it's about changing the language, it's about changing the relationships um, and making sure that we're supporting people to, to self-manage and that we're giving them back the control. So the recovery package is an initiative that Macmillan have really endorsed and it's a series of interventions aimed at improving quality of life after treatment. A key component of that is the holistic needs assessments and this is usually performed by a nurse specialist but it might be another therapist and in London we've been doing that for about five years at two time points but actually an HNA as it's called could be performed at any key transition point because it's a quick assessment of all the quality of life domains and levels of distress that a patient may have. So it's giving the permission, patient permission to talk about things that might matter to them. It asks them to describe any physical concerns, emotional concerns, spiritual concerns, financial concerns, etc. And then it's up to them whether they want to disclose them and discuss them with the professional at that time. We run telephone clinics to do our H&As with individuals and we allow 20 to 30 minutes to have those conversations and that's the key thing about it. It's a conversation about those concerns and then action planning, what might be um, ways of helping that individual to manage them. So we're trying as much as possible to empower the individual to manage them themselves. What strategies are they using already that might be helping them? How do they think that we can help? Making some suggestions, but really trying to help sit the the patient at the at the uh, centre of this to say, you know, we're here to help you, but ideally you're you're self managing these issues. So that's the survivorship care plan. Uh, also part of the recovery package is the treatment summary, which I'll come on to later. The cancer care review, which should be done by the GP, and the health and wellbeing events. So the health and wellbeing events are again. Uh, educational events um, we run them here every month we invite people to come along to a series of lectures to hear about managing common concerns they get a chance to talk to other people um, we're also teaching them about healthy lifestyle and health promotion is a really important part of cancer survivorship thinking about how we can help individuals uh, to become more physically active to take on better uh, behaviors to stop smoking reduction of alcohol um, and dietary changes that will help them also live well and reduce cancer chances of another cancer and other diseases. So on this slide, I have in the top left-hand corner a copy of the h and I'm hoping you've all seen one of these before. Um, this is a paper copy, but increasingly now we're trying to do these electronically. And that can be through an iPad where the patient touches through the screen, um, or it might be a link that's sent to them and they do it on the home computer and then send it back to us. And then we might have the telephone conversation about those concerns over the phone or it might happen in the clinic or even on the ward. Um, so this is an important kind of screening. It's just the start of the assessment process. It may be that they identify something like fatigue, which is very common. Probably 70% of this patient group are going to suffer from fatigue. Um, and then we will, may want to do a more detailed, validated um, assessment um, of fatigue using, for instance, the Piper scale or the uh, uh, other fatigue uh, measure um, and to find out more but it's at least a starting point it's that conversation that's really key exploring in detail the nature of their concerns and how we can help them so that's the H&A um, and it's interesting that we find that patients may have after rectal cancer treatment maybe three to uh, 12 concerns. I think the most I've had 17 after somebody had executive surgery. But then we'll say to them, which of those do you want to discuss today? Which of these are the most important to you? 
and you'll see on this slide a summary of the top concerns that uh, were identified by colorectal cancer patients after they'd had treatment. We tried to do our HNA again within six weeks of completing treatment. And the top three concerns uh, noted were worry, um, anxiety, fatigue, as I've mentioned, and bowel function. So for example, if worry was identified, we'd start by asking their reasons for the worry. What are they doing to manage it? Uh, to what extent is it intruding or invading in their life? And I think that's a really key point when we're thinking about those fears of cancer recurrence, very common uh, in this patient group. Um, I mean, yeah, we don't talk about it enough and we sort of just accept that that's um, to be expected. Um, but yeah, it can be really invasive and it can stop people really enjoying their lives. So we need to talk about it. And we, there are ways to manage it. Um, and listening just to you know what they're doing about that, giving them strategies, worry books, maybe thinking about psychological input if that's needed. Uh, but listening is a really important part of the, the management approach. This feels very much like a, a partnership, offering our knowledge and skills, um, normalising those, um, giving suggestions, but keeping them really in control and really central to, to what's being recommended. Control, I think, is often lost or, or, or damaged, that sense of personal uh, control uh, through this treatment. Uh, and indeed, my PhD was looking at the process of recovery following colorectal cancer, and I found that to be the main difficulty that people had. They lost a sense of control, not only over their body, but over their care. Um, they were quite happy to give up that sense of control early on when they were really scared about their own life and if they were going to be able to survive this. But as they, as they recovered, they felt that they hadn't got full control over their bodies and that they were struggling to, to get that back. So I've said the HNA is a starting point. It's a generalised screening tool to enable the conversation. It's giving patients permission to talk about things they may not realise that they can talk to their CNS or other therapist about, like financial concerns, which can be a, a real worry for people. We know that people will suffer a, a financial hit from being diagnosed with cancer. Um, we know that colorectal cancer patients are much less likely to return to full-time work, um, and some don't retire, return to work at all. Plus, there are extra costs, hidden costs of being diagnosed with cancer, perhaps in terms of new dietary requirements. There's all the car parking costs, et cetera. So we might need to do other, uh, other screening measures and patient reported outcome measures may well be needed. I commonly would use a hospital anxiety and depression score if I was worried about somebody. As part of our h and we'll do a, a distress score, which just is a visual analog scale, 0 to 10, what level of distress have you had in the last week? Four and above would be significant for needing to suggest some intervention and over six, I might be suggesting had they thought about some talking therapy. Um, and in our area, you patients can self-refer for, for, for instance, CBT. That's not for everybody, but keeping an eye on it um, and doing further assessments might be a good starting point. The recovery package has been uh, endorsed by the latest cancer strategy, and there is an expectation that all patients will be offered the recovery package. So the HNA, the health and wellbeing event, a treatment summary and a cancer care review. There's been evolution since then to now think about how we may be able to personalise care and incorporate holistic needs assessment into a more comprehensive programme of management of what's becoming increasingly seen as a long-term condition. But also situating cancer within the care that's given to anybody with an, a, a long-term condition. I think that's a good move because we can then think about how we can utilise primary care services that maybe move outside the health model and think more about social care. Because it may be somebody's biggest concern after they've had rectal cancer treatment is that isolation. Some of the older patient group who've lost many of their social uh, supports uh, may be stuck at home feeling very isolated and that exacerbates mental health issues, for instance. So the personalised care approach is looking at how we can build resilience um, in an individual by linking them more into community support and uh, identifying what their social care needs might be. Um, and there is a move to social prescribing, thinking about um, how we can identify their social care needs as part of a um, support uh, network for them in the community. I welcome those initiatives because firstly, it's recognising that cancer is a long-term condition. And even if somebody has received curative treatment, there may well be a, um, a legacy to that in terms of uh, longer-term consequences of having been treated. They may be fearing recurrence 
they may be more at risk of developing a new cancer um, and either way they're still likely to be in, in surveillance. Secondly, it's broadening people's horizons to thinking about trying to change the emphasis. So much of our aftercare, after rates of cancer treatments, is situated in, in um, secondary care. We need to move it back to primary care and make sure that they are utilising the services that might be available in their local area. You know, uh, a lady who I got to go to the local gym who had hardly exercised previously through the exercise referral scheme, it's revolutionised her life because she goes now to the gym. She, she may not be particularly physically active, but she's getting out of the house she has a reason for for being um, she's more active than she was and she's made friends as her local gym for another person it might be a gardening club it had men who started at men's bike sheds it might be a choir this kind of the broader help um, initiatives that might help people to live well Thirdly, it's about recognising that there'll be a percentage of cancer survivors that need more specialist intervention. So the comprehensive personalised model is about targeting those with the most complex needs. And it's possibly those that we should be focusing our energies on back in secondary care to make sure that they do get the right follow up. Um, and finally, it recognises the importance of personalising care, that one model doesn't fit all. And we'll come back to that later when we're thinking about surveillance pathways. So just to recap, we've been thinking about the notion of what the cancer survivor is and the initiatives that we've been putting in place over the last 10 years to help with helping people live well with and beyond cancer. And we've seen those evolve to a point that we have a uh, endorsed model for helping people to recover, the recovery package. Um, the expectation is that all patients should be offered that. Uh, and a key part of that is the assessment, which hopefully will happen not just before and after treatment, but maybe other key transition points. There's also the treatment summary, the health and wellbeing events and the cancer care review that come with that. So assessment's really key to this. Not only need to be assessing patients' expectations before treatment and engaging them in the process of decision making, but we want to assess how they are after treatment. And the HNA is a starting point for that. But hopefully other validated measures for specific concerns, whether that be pain, anxiety or fatigue, would be incorporated into assessment to understand more about the nature of that concern and how that's impacting on the individual's life. More recently, we've started to look broader than health and wellbeing into social care and new models are developing to help integrate cancer into a long-term condition model and thinking about how we can utilise services in the community, uh, particularly in terms of social care, to help people with their wellbeing and to feel more integrated in their local communities. So as I showed you on the EHNA data, the Electronic Holistic News Assessment data, Bowel function is a common concern for people after treatment, but indeed, it, as we've mentioned, it's also a concern for people before treatment about how their bowel function might be. Park et al. in 2014 found a high degree of patient uncertainty and worry about bowel function in this patient group, so it's important we address those concerns from the start. I'm wondering how many people may have heard of the Polar tool that's available on the Pelican website. It preoperatively predicts the LARS score, the low anterior section syndrome score. Um, and this uh, may be very useful in having dialogue with patients about their risk of having a alteration in bowel function. It uses the same criteria as the LARS score, giving people a, um, a no risk, a moderate risk or minor risk and a severe risk. And this work done by uh, Nick Battersea et al has uh, investigated those patients um, who are going to be at, ident helps identify those patients who are going to be at higher risk. Um, so you put in, it's an interactive tool that you can put in their uh, particular demographics. Um, you're looking at the patient's age, their sex, whether they might need a total mesorectal excision or partial one, uh, the, the tumour height from the anal verge, whether they've had radiotherapy or not, and if a stoma's planned. You can then calculate the score um, and say whether they're at higher risk of developing symptoms after they've had um, cancer, this cancer treatment. And the cutoff values taken are taken from the original development and validation of the LARS score that was conducted by Emerson et al. in 2012, uh, which was available in the Annals of Surgery. I think by using this interactive tool, helping to prepare the patient for the fact that their bowel function um, is going to be different. Um, and many people have a poor conception of how the bowels work, uh, the complexity involved in defecation, um, and uh, what the surgery is actually going to do to uh, anatomically to their to their surgery if they're having, for instance, an anterior section and, and TME. 
And um, interestingly, a subsequent study by done by Emerson et al. in 2014 found that post-operatively the scores assigned by specialists were significantly different from those of the patient. As a specialist, we may uh, place more emphasis on incontinence of liquid school and frequency of the bowels opening, but perhaps we underestimate the importance of urgency of bowel motions and also clustering of bowel motions, which you know to be a common problem after a low anterior resection. Looking at the left-hand column of the slide on assessing function, I've suggested um, that we think about bowel function uh, a little bit more. Um, whilst it might improve over time, um, particularly um, in the months following restorative procedures or after temporary stoma closure, um, as the physiology changes, that there will be increased fluid reabsorption, uh, that becomes a better understanding of the um, coordination, uh, the muscles' strength perhaps improves. But we know that perhaps in half this patient group, uh, they will still be struggling with um, change in bowel function um, uh, at a year. Um, and it's about managing those expectations because a lot of the people that we meet in our Lars clinic just think that they're going to get back a normal bowel function that they maybe want once once a day, eight in the morning, um, and now they're going three or four times a day and they're feeling a bit tied to the toilet with the repeated toileting that's quite common after Lars. Now, um, the, um, there's quite a lot we can do to help this whilst there's no empirical support to guide optimal management of bowel problems. Um, there are a number of different interventions that we can suggest um, and they're really quite simply and easily employed and the first of it is just explaining what has happened, the changes that have occurred as a result of the surgery and how their anatomy looks now, what is the defecation reflex and, and what has been um, happening to cause for instance the incomplete evacuation, the decreased uh, discrimination of stool inflators in their bowel and quite often a heightened gastrocolic reflex. So we start by looking at uh, their bowel function. We'll do the Lars score. We'll think about dietary adjustment. Um, sometimes people are taking three or four strong caffeinated drinks a day. It's an easy change that can be made if they're having frequency to take that out of the diet and have decaffeinated drinks. Maybe about thinking about decreasing in the insoluble fibre. Um, or it might be about having regular meals. A lot of these patients uh, take on um, the thought that perhaps if they don't eat at all during the day, they're going to get through the day without needing to open their bowels. But that's not an adaptive coping strategy and it's one that we need to change. We use a lot of loperamide um, and we titrate it. Uh, quite often we might use the liquid. Uh, we might add a bulking agent if people are having difficulty evacuating like Normacol. And we can teach them behavioural techniques such as deferred defecation, sitting on the toilet properly um, and uh, instigating good bowel habits. They're all part of the, the management programme. It doesn't take a lot of intervention to get people to a point where they feel that they're in control of their bowels again that they can eat a relatively normal diet and they can do the things that they need to do without feeling that they uh, need to be only a few minutes from the toilet. So uh, hopefully we can do quite a lot to improve people's bowel function and it, it shouldn't take too many uh, sessions of intervention to, to make a difference. But it's important that we keep assessing because symptoms might change over time and unpredictability can be a key part of the experience of having anterior section syndrome. People may get back on track and then they may find that the pattern changes again and they need to come back. Um, so if, or if problems persist, you know, think about referring to gastroenterology um, and of course we must exclude that there's no recurrent disease but being realistic with people about what they can expect in helping them with that recalibration uh, to what their new normal is going to be um, and finding what might be a tolerable bowel function for them to allow them to, to, to live well. Those who are going to have the worst symptoms, of course, those who are going to have the lowest anastomoses um, and those who've had pelvic radiation will definitely have uh, a risk of a higher uh, altered bowel function. Um, and we must bear in mind the, the catalogue of uh, conditions associated with pelvic radiation disease uh, that might need uh, further examination of. Moving to the right column on slide four, looking at sexual function now, a common concern for both men and women with great variety in prevalence, reported from 5 to 90% uh, in rectal cancer outcome studies. And we know that the depth of pelvic dissection is likely to increase uh, sexual dysfunction. 
Um, we also know that neoadjuvant radiotherapy will increase, um, and this may well be a delayed effect uh, for individuals. And the, the etiology may well be multifactorial. So there does need to be um, you know, a number of things uh, working well to have a normal sexual function. It needs to be intact nervous system, but also vascular mechanisms, hormonal mechanisms. There needs to be psychological well-being for people to have the, the desire. But there also needs to be a relationship conducive to having uh, this uh, uh, sexual uh, relationship. So we're not great at talking about this subject, are we? And um, perhaps we need to really think about our discussions preoperatively uh, and make sure that the impact on sexual function for both men and women is uh, frankly discussed. Um, and also, we definitely under-refer these patients to specialist services. So if you're treating people with people with rect for rectal cancer, and consider what services you have in place, what information is there available. Um, it, in many senses, there may be some service for men, but less commonly is there a service for women. If you don't have that service available, um, how can you develop a referral pathway to a specialist centre nearby? There are private therapists that can be found through uh, the directory of uh, relationship therapists, um, but not everybody can afford that. So some thoughts for practice are making sure you're familiar with the guidance and what might be you may be able to prescribe for people. Thinking about how your documentation during surgery, are you routinely recording whether this has been nerve sparing surgery or not? Um, and, and even just making sure that at all key points in the follow-up pathway, the subject's being openly disclosed, um, are they having any difficulties, um, and consider screening with simple validated tools such as the Yortec QLQ CRC29. Because multiple studies have shown a strong correlation between sexual dysfunction and psychosocial distress. So this slide's really a summary of what we've been talking about so far. And I would hope that if the patient's been offered the different interventions with the recovery package, the holistic needs assessment with a care plan that should come out of that, a health and wellbeing event, a treatment summary and cancer care review, they will have had a comprehensive survivorship care plan. So just to think a little bit more about the treatment summary, because that's really the responsibility of the treating clinician, the surgeon in this case, um, to summarise the treatment that has been given, the recommendations for the follow-up schedule, the surveillance, the alert symptoms. What are the symptoms that an individual needs to know about that might be a cause for concern? Uh, because many will be worried about what might be an indicator of, of uh, recurrent disease um, and when to seek help and who to get that help from and ways of managing their health and well-being and, and any referrals that have been made. So this is a, a template exists. Um, it's really a page and it needs to be slightly different from a standard clinic letter, which is often a very retrospective account of um, what surgery has been done and how the patient is today. It needs to include that, of course, but it needs to add more to say, this is what we anticipate the care is going to be um, and what future problems could occur uh, and what are we doing to support the patient over the next five years. And um, I think that's really important for telling the patient uh, what to expect, but it's also useful for the GP. And this tool has been evaluated in different settings by Macmillan and has been very well received, particularly uh, by GPs who needed that information to help support the individual and then also to perform their cancer care review. I think it's a really useful communication tool um, and put together with the HNA really gives people that plan for their cancer survivorship for the future. So the final side indicates how all this can come together as a programme of aftercare and I use those words uh, deliberately because we need to move away from thinking about follow-up. Uh, semantics are important here because the follow-up suggests it's the professional taking responsibility, taking control for that individual's care. We want the shift the emphasis as I've been saying to the individual to help them feel that they are being supported to manage their own uh, aftercare. So what do we know about patients' priorities at this stage? I did a pilot of uh, patients who were moved on to a supportive self-management programme uh, a few years back. 
Um, you may well be running supported um, self-management in your own hospitals or stratified follow-up care, as we're calling it in some centres, where the patient won't routinely be coming back after they've had their rectal cancer treatment. They are, of course, still getting their surveillance, um, but they're not coming to the outpatient department. They don't need to. They've been identified to be perhaps a low-risk group, a group that are able to self-manage, um, but they still have the support of the team for five years. So in the clinic that we ran, the patient would come for a, a survivorship appointment to uh, have a holistic assessment. They get their care plan, the treatment summary, and then they would be put onto telephone support and their surveillance would happen remotely. The things that they said in the satisfaction survey that we did after the pilot were, that really mattered to them was having somebody that they could contact, number one, who they trusted to deliver a competent service and coordinate their care. And that sense of coordination is really important, that they know that they're going to get the scan and that somebody's going to tell them about the scan soon afterwards, that somebody's overseeing and tracking their surveillance. But the other thing that really mattered to them was having easy access back into the service should there be problems and um, being able to get them back into a surgical review clinic within two weeks was the standard that we set. And that gave them a lot of confidence that actually they didn't need to be routinely coming back because quite often they'd be coming back to clinic and, and felt well and didn't need to. And in delivering safe, effective a well-coordinated programme of aftercare, we all have different roles to play. And I chose this slide partly to highlight the different MDT members' responsibilities. So we need to make sure that we have admin support if we're running uh, stratified follow-up. And so there is somebody there to help coordinate, not insignificant amount of admin that goes with managing people on remote surveillance. Um, you'll still be running your virtual clinics, generating letters, and there's a need to make sure that that's well managed. There's the radiology and endoscopy input. There's the surgeon's responsibilities, the nurses, but of course, foremost, it's the patient at the centre of all of this, and um, making sure that we work well together as a team so that they get the right uh, support that they need to manage their physical, psychological and social needs. We also need to enlist the care of the GP, and we can do that by giving them the treatment summary, which will encourage the cancer care review, and hopefully enable the patient to utilise more services within the community. So who decides what follow-up pathway or aftercare the patient should receive? Is that the MDT's decision? Is it the patient's decision? How do we make that decision about what's going to be best for them in their first five years after they've had rectal cancer treatment? Well, hopefully it's a team decision in partnership with the patient. There may be some people who have low-risk disease but actually don't have the social support and self-efficacy uh, and the wherewithal, the health navigation skills to manage their uh, aftercare without coming back to see the specialists in, in secondary care. There may be other people who are very confident, even with higher risk disease, to be on a remote surveillance programme. Um, so I think that it really is important that we look not just at the, the tumour but at the whole person when we're stratifying patients and that that decision is made in conjunction with the patient uh, on the MDT's recommendations. So in summary today we've been thinking how we can as a team assist an individual in making the transition from being a cancer patient to a cancer survivor. Uh, some of the commonest concerns that they may have, the importance of assessing those, particularly early on, and reassessing them later. They can be later effects too. Use of validated measures if there's time, if there's expertise in using them, can be really helpful in understanding more about the impact that they may be having on somebody's life. It's got to be a, a partnership with the, the person living with and beyond that cancer to work out their priorities um, and what they would like help with making sure that we do use the services available, whether it be in the community, but also more specialist services, whether it be gastroenterologists, physiotherapists, rehabilitation specialists, uh, to help people to live well with and beyond cancer is really vital to this. And um, keeping the patient's needs central to all our decision making. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. It'd be really helpful if you could tell us what brought you to St Mark's. Um, I was really, really poorly back in 2017. Um, I'd woken up from a coma and ba basically told there and then that I had stage four colorectal cancer mm. and I'd just survived um, sepsis right. and, yeah, found out 
that way. So it was all quite traumatic. Mm. And what was happening at your local hospital at that time? At that time, um, they referred me to the Royal Marsden. And that's where I had uh, my chemotherapy and radiotherapy in the hope to shrink the tumour. Mm. So that then St Mark's would do this major, major surgery. Your local hospital had told you at the time that they couldn't offer you any surgery? They did, yeah, Um, which was really, really scary at the time. And I've got two small children and very nerve-wracking, so I put all my hopes into this chemo major therapy. How did you feel about the surgery when you came to meet us at the St Mark's? Um, Very grateful to have been offered it. Um, I don't think I personally researched enough into it. It sounded daunting. I knew that life would be different and I was told that I, it would be like going to hell and back. <laughs> it was. <laughs> but, um, yeah, nervous. Did you think about not having the surgery? I did consider it, yes, because I thought if my lifestyle would be worse like I didn't really on then it would how do I explain this I did consider not having the surgery at one point because I would be more disabled and if I had that if I would really suffer on the other side and I, it all goes through your head you do consider not doing it but then you think of everyone around you and think of the future and that's what really swayed it for me mm-hmm. thank you it's a difficult decision nonetheless yes yeah. it was and what do you remember actually about the surgery itself I remember waking up in a lot of pain I had tubes, drains, everything hanging out of me. It was quite frightening, especially when you were in the intensive care bit, um, because I was completely out of it with the pain medications. Um, So I was a bit doolally for the first few days, which was quite scary. Um, And then you're moved on to the ward, which was um, testing, to say the least. (laughs) But uh, uh, it, the main issues were pain and comfort. Mm-hmm. What did you find particularly testing at that time? Um, being on the ward, I would say, so soon, mm. I don't think you'd got the immediate... You'd have to wait like everybody else for the rounds unless something was, you know, that bad. You'd have to re- get your friend, friend or family to re- go and get the nurse for you because you're bed bound mm. so that was tough mm. I remember you feeling trapped in your bed for... you are yeah mm. you do feel trapped mm. um and you're not allowed to be on your back for the first I don't know how many weeks so I you're turned every few hours by nurses each nurse turns you differently so that was quite painful um, because also you had drains sort of in the sides of your hips, so you're on your side on those drains. <laughs> so, yes, it was challenging. How do you manage to eat when you're lying flat on your side? Oh, I found ways, yeah. No, I had a really big appetite, actually, so I was, was yeah, I <laughs> didn't have any wor- troubles eating on my side. And what did you do with yourself during that time? Because you were in hospital some weeks, weren't you? I was, I think it was a nearly eight weeks mm. I was in um, so I used my iPad phone listened to music read a lot of magazines um, and fa- friends and family were there to keep you company mm. so that was nice so the last few weeks just before you went home were you able to do m- more for yourself what was it um, like then? yes definitely with the help of the physio they were great um, they get you up and um well essentially I learned to walk again um so it was very slow but you'd have physio every day so that was one positive um and then you just sort of work you're quite good in your bed you have everything to hand so um yeah and the nurses were lovely once you got to know them all 
How did it feel then going back home? Difficult. Yeah, it was really difficult. I couldn't... Um, I was supposed to go to rehab, um, but there wasn't available rehab for me, and I was so desperate to get out. But unfortunately, I have a second floor flat, so that made it very tricky. So I moved into my mother's, who had a downstairs bedroom and bathroom, and I was there for a few weeks, which helped because I have small children, so she was helping with them. And I was carrying on with physio and going to the local GP to have my dressings changed. Right. How were you moving at that stage? With a gutter frame. Mm-hmm. And the OTs came out to my home and assessed what I needed in the home. So I had a little granny trolley with wheels, which I still have, um, and crutches and new handles around the house to help me get around. Mm -hmm. So a few weeks of being at your mum's and then you went back to your second floor flat. I went back to my second floor flat, so it would take me about 15 minutes to get up the stairs and then I was sort of trapped in my flat, so I had to move. So I'm very happy and I have a ground floor flat, again, which the OTs came out and checked all over and did what necessary adjustments I needed at home. (laughs) How did you manage through those first few weeks at home? You were on your own and you had your children back living with you. Yeah, um, my mum would visit every day and my sister. I don't don't have a carer, but maybe looking back I should have got one. But yeah, you just make small adjustments around the house, like all my pots and pans are now high up rather than down, so I don't have to bend over so much and pick up um, heavy things. Um, The children help a lot, they're good at making cups of tea. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's a struggle. And now we're 15 months on from the surgery, aren't we? We are. You come in today, you've driven your adapted car, you've walked across the hospital <laughs> with just one stick and you've looked very strong on your feet and you've been telling me that you've recently had a day trip into London, which is the first time that you've done something yeah. major like that. Um, yeah, it's daunting. I definitely had to plan ahead. Um, I've got a disabled badge, so that helps because, you know, you just... Things like going shopping, you do think, oh, God, how close am I to the car? Um, And, yeah, it's things like that you do have to plan in advance because it is tricky. Mm. Is there anything you think you wish you'd known before you had the surgery done that might be helpful for somebody who's watching this video to hear from you? I think I should have maybe got in touch with people that have had the surgery previous to me um I think that would have helped I think I I didn't take it as seriously like they say the surgeon said that my walking would be affected I as in a main nerve was going to be taken and luckily not my major one um but I didn't really take it in and believe him really um but yeah my leg has been affected and it's difficult and takes some getting used to and a lot lot of physio to get to where I am now Mm. so recommendation is doing some more research speaking to people if you can understanding as much as possible about what the surgeon's telling you about this operation and do a lot of research um I mean it all all the medical terms seem like gobbledygook beforehand, but now I could say I could be a qualified nurse. <laughs> um, it all sort of makes a lot more sense looking back on your notes. and Because I think when beforehand you're in this massive cloud, your head's in this cloud, it's foggy, and you really... It all makes a lot of sense now you read back on the notes and things like that so I think yeah just to get to know your notes and your body and recognize um difficulties Mm. so thank you for sharing your experience (laughs) 
What a fantastic lecture that was. Uh, and we'll be discussing that in more detail later on in the program. But for now, let's look at one of our complex MDT cases that was discussed earlier in the day. Hello and welcome to the Iceni Centre's Rectal Cancer Multidisciplinary Team meeting. Uh, my name is Greg Wynn. I'm one of the consultant colorectal surgeons here in Colchester in the UK. And I'm delighted to be able to invite here today an expert panel from around the country to discuss these difficult cases. Before we start, I'd like to get them to introduce themselves to you. I'm uh, Farah Din, a colorectal consultant from Edinburgh. Hello, my name's Armand Septain. I'm a clinical oncologist. I work at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Uh, I'm uh, Vries. I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon uh, with a special interest in colorectal metastases uh, in the liver. I'm Ian Daniels. I'm a colorectal surgeon from Exeter. I'm Anna Wordley. I'm clinical nurse specialist for colorectal cancer at Colchester Hospital. Hello, I'm Tan Aralampalam. I'm a colorectal surgeon in Colchester. My name's Hugo Ford. I'm a medical oncologist from Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Najib Habubi, pathologist, GI pathologist in Manchester, UK. Thank you very much. So without further ado, we'll get on with the first case. Uh, this is a 65-year-old lady with a BMI of 23. She's fit and active with a performance status of zero. She's presented with a change in her bowel habit. She has a significant past medical history of Lynch syndrome with an MSH2 mutation. She has a son and daughter in their, both in their 20s in Australia. It's not clear whether they've been screened for Lynch syndrome. She's had a previous uh, abdominal hysterectomy and oophorectomy for endometrial carcinoma 20 years ago, and she had adjuvant pelvic radiotherapy after that. She had a colonoscopy only 18 months ago, which was reported as normal. On examination, uh, digital examination was normal. Colonoscopy showed an impassable rectal cancer at 12 centimetres from the verge. Biopsies have confirmed adenocarcinoma. So Bruce, can we have some staging for this lady, please? That's what the cancer should look like at endoscopy. So I'm showing you two um, sequences from the MR from uh, uh, the presentation. And uh, you can see the tumour sits here in the um, upper rectum, approximately 12 centimetres, we said, from the anal verge. And you'll notice that there is, um, it's an annular tumour and there's a growth of tumour out posteriorly. This is following the vascular plane, so this is consistent with extramural vascular invasion, but there's disruption of the vascular plane itself, there's, the vessels are destroyed, so this is consistent with T3 tumour. And it's gone on to the posterior margin, so it's involving the uh, circumferential margin posteriorly. Um, looking for nodal stage, there, are, there don't appear to be any obvious nodes, but these are tumour deposits here, which, although it's slightly difficult to see, actually again follow the vessels, and these are di this is discontinuous vascular spread. So the stage on, uh, the, um, uh, on the imaging so far is uh, T3, N0, uh, EMVI2, and the CT didn't show anything other than constipation above the tumour, so it's M0. Okay. <clears throat> Before we discuss the detail of the case, Farah, can you just give us an overview of how the Lynch syndrome is going to impact on our MDT discussions? Uh, well, I think firstly, f with this particular case in mind, um, we in fact already know that Lynch syndrome, that this patient has Lynch syndrome, and I would stage and manage this patient as for their rectal cancer. Um, as per any sporadic rectal cancer in the first instance. And then the question is whether there would be any benefit from removing more of the colon. Um, but clearly, in this patient with uh, a rectal cancer at 65 and a rectal cancer potentially with a threatened margin, um, it's not someone that one would consider, so for instance, a, a proctocolectomy and ileoanal pouch surgery in. So I would say with this particular case in mind, there isn't anything specific that would impact. Um, she's already also had a hysterectomy um, and bilateral salpingo in the past. Um, I think the, the main 
concern here is um, given she's had radiation before, uh, well, as firstly is, is getting a handle on the obstruction um, element uh, and whether there's any treatment, any, any uh, role for neoadjuvant treatment here and whether she can have any. So at this particular stage, no. Okay. Anna, how, how, how are people with inherited colorectal cancers, how do they... Do they behave differently? Do, do they bring, obviously they bring some baggage to the discussions uh, with clinicians. How are they different from other, other cancer cases? I think it depends very much on whether they've complied with their surveillance. Um, we have a recent case where, where a patient de you know, declined and, and waited another year um, and then had advanced colorectal cancer. But this particular patient had done everything that had been asked of her. Um, and it's quite a difficult conversation to have with her to say this was appeared to be and was reported as a completely normal colonoscopy only um, a year or 18 months ago. Um, but obviously having conversations about you know, whether she in turn would, would lose her whole colon, whether that would be beneficial to her, um, that's going to have wider implications on her you know, longer term quality of life. Um, so it, it becomes a more complex, um, and as you quite rightly say, then there's the question about her children and um, siblings. Um, but I would think in Australia that they would be being screened. Okay, well, we've got to get control of the cancer that's presented um, to us at the present time. So Sibs, is there any, any role for any further radiotherapy here at all? Uh, so before I answer that, I just would, a bit more clarity on the MRI. So there's definite CRM positivity. There is. This is the subsequent imaging. And over how long is that? Um, I can go back to showing you the first presentation. Um, so um, if we look posteriorly, yeah. there you can see the CRM is involved posteriorly. Right. Um, so, yeah. It's not into the sacrum, but it's certainly into the, uh, where, the, where the presacral fascia and the, and the uh, mesorectal fascia are very close to one. Thank you. So um, there are three or four factors that come to mind. Firstly is her Lynch syndrome. Uh, we know that MSI deficient patients are resistant to 5-FU in general. Um, there's a school of thought that adding an oxaliplatin will overcome that potential resistance. So one thought I'm having is about induction chemotherapy alone, especially given the EMVI, which, uh, which predicates a high risk of metastatic and local recurrence. Um, the second factor to consider is her previous radiotherapy. So we would make every effort to find those uh, volumes and the dosimetry with that to make a judgment on whether there was space for more treatment. Uh, I guess the third consideration is really to push my surgical colleagues to see whether, despite the reported CRM, they could do something more extensive to achieve clear margins, perhaps by resecting the inner part of the, uh, the bone there. Uh, and then the fourth consideration is, if all of the above are not possible, whether we could consider intraoperative radiotherapy, um, which I have some limited experience of. But when, although the quality of studies isn't very good, um, there's that common sense approach of it having a place and some early data showing that we get better local control. Okay. So it, it's, a, you know, it's quite a nuanced discussion with lots of different factors in. Um, there is no absolute contraindication to radiotherapy here with modern techniques. So we could um, give a gentler dose, if you like, to the rest of the nodal uh, bed and boost the very posterior part where that margin is positive using a rapid arc. That type of okay. What are the risks to the patient of doing that, <coughs> using more radiotherapy? So rear radiation, it's the late effects that are at risk. So the thing that governs the dose we give to any tumour is what the normal tissues can withstand. So in fact there's no limit to the dose we can give except for the normal tissue surrounding the tumour. So um, the risks would be damage to the bone uh, and neural tissue in particular, increased fibrosis. And if vascular structures were nearby, which they don't seem to be, but if they were, they would be at risk of, of blowout there. Um, but fortunately, there are very rare complications. Uh, in terms of calculating what dose we can give safely, we need to look at what dose has been given before, calculate something called the biologically effective dose, 
and that's based on this formula, the Nino quadratic modelling, which governs how uh, tumours respond and recover to previous radiation. So once we know what the biologically affected dose that has been given is, we can account for some recovery, <coughs> it's a long time since the previous treatment, work out how much uh, dose we have left to give, and then you can calculate a, a kind of um, bespoke dose and dose fractionation schedule for the patient. Okay. So that would be my approach if all of the others weren't possible. Ian, surgical options, we're just going to get this out, aren't we? Well, well, I, well we've got a chance to. So, that, this is where this is where the I mean, at the moment, I presume this lady is really quite symptomatic, yes. you know. And then, given the description that um, you know, there's a lot of constipation up above this, um, so I, I was what was going through my mind was if we're going to consider a near adjuvant strategy, then we also need to know what's going on in the colon upstream. I'd rather give her a colostomy than an ileostomy if we're going to give a chemo up front. Um, there is the option that I could offer her a loop colostomy, <coughs> then rescope the colon above and assess that, and then treat below. In terms of going straight to primary surgery, then, you know, I agree with what you say about it is possible to take out the anterior table of the sacrum, etc. Mm -hmm. But at that point, if you've then got recurrent disease at that point, and then you're thinking about further problems later on in terms of recurrence, um, I think we're probably, well, I probably wouldn't be keen to do that because not for not being able to do it today, but the concern for the future again of what is left mm -hmm. should she develop a problem. Given that she's otherwise fit and well, I'd rather we be, personally, manage her symptoms in the first instance, look for a neoadjuvant strategy and then go for surgery. Yeah. Where's that surgery going to take place? At well, um, so I think this is one of those cases where you know, we fit the classic MDT description of a, to discuss uncertainty where uncertainty exists, and it's got to be in a centre which manages and has the capability to do uh, beyond TME, colorectal surgery is the current phrase, but certainly a centre with all the facilities available, including spines, plastics, etc., urology, to be able to do more advanced disease. Okay, so at least get them involved at an early stage uh, and get their opinion yeah. and, and allow them to agree the neo strategy. So she was defunctioned with a loop colostomy and she was referred to a beyond TME centre. Unfortunately, the date for surgery for this patient was in three months' time. In order to ameliorate the situation, they advised to give some chemotherapy in the meantime. Hugo, what sort of chemotherapy are you looking at and how effective is this going to be for this patient? Well, so, um, uh, so as I've already mentioned, Lynch syndrome, fiber view itself, probably not very effective. So at a minimum, you know, we'd be looking at a combination of fluoropyrimidine and oxaliplatin. But even with that, you know, there's some uncertainty as to, as, as to whether that's going to give you the disease control. Some patients with Lynch syndrome do respond very well to, to combination chemotherapy, but it's unquestionably some don't. I think the other thing that perhaps we're not thinking about now, but which we almost certainly will be thinking about for these patients in the future, is immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So these Lynch syndrome patients, they tend to have a high tumor mutation burden. There's a very interesting study recently published of neoadjuvant nivolumab and ipilimumab, which are two immunotherapy agents, yeah. with 100% path CR rate uh, in neoadjuvant colorectal <coughs> cancer uh, for, for high TMB patients. So I think it's very likely that you know, in the future, we'll be looking at immunotherapy for these sorts of patients. With the current state of knowledge, I think we'll be looking at combination therapy, probably eight to 12 weeks of uh, oxaliplatin and fluoropyrimidine. Within the genetic spectrum of uh, uh, Lynch syndrome, is there any preference of uh, chemotherapy or not chemotherapy? I mean, if the uh, is, that, is that something which we need to be considered? Because, I mean, I think Lynch syndrome, there is a, a, some sort of a blanket there, but yeah. I mean, there are, there are some genetic variation within uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the the syndrome. So I'd, I'd like to ask her and the, our oncologist whether their, their views about that. Well, so um, I don't think we're really differentiating within the different um, underlying mutations which cause Lynch syndrome at the moment. Don't. No, we, 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 but we are treating on the phenotype. So people are looking at, for example, for immunotherapy, high tumor mutation burden being a marker, you know, of uh, of 
potential response to immunotherapy. Right. You know, regardless of the of the underlying um, genetic mutation. Gen, genetic mutation. Right. Um, and for, so, for example, for people who've got an epigenetic, um, as it were, Lynch phenotype, um, you know, of, often people are looking at. Uh, 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 whether IO actually you no know, oncology immunotherapy will be an appropriate treatment for them, um, but at the moment not on the underlying driver mutation. Okay. Okay. So, her chemotherapy was poorly tolerated, um, with increasing symptoms uh, just after one cycle, um, and the oncologists were a little bit worried about her, um, so she was restaged. They also, the tertiary centre also asked for a staging laparoscopy, which we did. There was a little bit of um, ascites, which was sent for cytology, which was negative <coughs> for malignant cells uh, and was otherwise normal. Can I ask whether, why we didn't consider a PET scan in this patient? If, you've, if you're with a tolerating chemotherapy, right, why a staging laparoscopy and not a PET scan at that point, if there's concern? Um, I think that the management was being driven by the tertiary centre. The tertiary centre hasn't asked for a PET scan. Um, we wouldn't re routinely ask for a PET scan if there was nothing else seen on the CT scan mm. and there was no other question to be answered. I don't know your thoughts on that, Bruce, in terms no, of PET I mean, CTs in this situation. M mindful of the coexisting tumour risk, once it was going to maybe have a lower threshold for looking more carefully, but the CT looked like it was pelvic disease and there wasn't anything to make us think that it was otherwise. I mean, there wasn't metastatic disease, so we weren't looking for the burden of metastatic <coughs> disease, which we would routinely do yeah. uh, a PET scan then to sort of quantify the, the totality of it. But at the early stage, I don't think we would have, we would have done a PET scan necessarily. Okay, so let's have a look at her restaging scans. <coughs> so I'm showing you two scans. So this is the one on the right here is the initial scan, and the one on the left is the, the uh, follow-up following the chemotherapy. And you can see that the tumor bulk has increased. Um, there's now this uh, high signal stuff here is uh, some ascites. Um, if I show you the um, axial images, um, there is, um, the tumor has, there's still extensive extramural vascular invasion. That uh, discontinuous vascular nodule, um, vascular spread has enlarged, and you can see it right up onto the back of the peritoneum at that point. Can't see any because there's fluid next to it. You can see that it's still confined by the peritoneal surface, but you know the the risk is is that uh, clearly that there is already peritoneal spread. Um, You've had your laparoscopy, which was clear, which is reassuring. But the uh, so the tumour has progressed, and it's now YT3 um, uh, C um, YN0 YV2, and the posterior margin remains involved. <coughs> okay. Anyone getting worried about this lady's primary tumour now? I mean, yeah. in, the, in the absence of any neoadjuvant um, options, then it's not clear that further waiting uh, mm. is beneficial. We're just watching the natural history of the disease progress. I guess, I guess the key thing is um, we've, we've lost control um, uh, and we're, you know, chemotherapy does have its limits. I think you, you mentioned in this, this sort of case, so we don't know how much... Uh, is this natural tumour or just um, uh, lack of response to chemotherapy? Um, and I think um, if you're going to have a surgical approach at this stage, uh, you've got to be very mindful of um, the high risk of recurrent disease. Um, so any uh, surgical strategy... Um, with all its attendant risks, has to be explained uh, very carefully to the patient. And as, you, as has been mentioned, this would be done in a beyond TME centre if, if you're going to go for radical surgery. In, in planning any surgery, I presume we've colonoscoped upstream from the colostomy and we know that there's no evidence of further disease upstream? We have, and it's normal. Okay. And, and we've made an assumption that this is going to be a segmental uh, resection. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, I think the other thing to think about, I'm sorry, is at this stage, I think I would be thinking about immunotherapy for this patient, mm. because we can access, <coughs> in this situation, after failure of chemotherapy, unsuitable chemotherapy, we, we can access um, uh, immunotherapy treatments. And I think, depending on your view of the potential of actually a successful operation at this time, mm. you know, we're in a situation where we've lost control of the disease. The chances of successful surgery are probably diminishing by the day. Um, and you then have to take a balance. Well, if we don't think that that's going to achieve, you know, what we want, there is another strategy, which would be immunotherapy. Yeah. And, and, and how... Well, but the issue is how quickly we get a response yeah. on it. Sure, exactly. Yeah, so I think Hugo's point about had we got this all up front and we had funding for immunotherapy and more evidence, that would be the way we'd go up front, wouldn't it? I think we have to contrast that to the potential radicality of surgery and the impact on exactly. on, on, yeah. on her, yeah. not just you know the, the, any bowel function with the colostomy, but also urinary function, etc., because of the position in this tumour and the impact on pelvic nerve function, etc. Do we have firm data about the outcome of immunotherapy in such subset of patients? Or this is just actually personal experiences? Not, not, not in this particular subset. You know, locally advanced rectal cancer, no, because obviously it's actually relatively uncommon uh -huh. for these to be Lynch syndrome, you know, patients, certainly in terms of clinical trials. But in terms of response rates to treatment, you know, we know there is a, a good response rate to immunotherapy in Lynch syndrome colorectal cancer generally, uh, and um, even after failure of chemotherapy. Um, and it is a balance with the morbidity of surgery. You know, you'd have to mm. understand that if it doesn't work, what does that then do to your surgical um, plans? You know, versus the fact that actually we all know that the outcomes of surgery in these patients are not good, you know, long, long term. And there's no, there is no, we've, we've excluded further radiotherapy. Well, no. there are I potentially. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't exclude it completely, but... This is growing quite quickly. In but would radiotherapy get us, given the risks of radi further radiotherapy versus surgery at this point? Um, so I, two things. One is where I'd ask you whether you'd consider folfoxiri and increasing the intensity of the chemotherapy by using triple agent rather than yep. double agent. That's <coughs> one approach. Um, what I'm feeling now with the way things are going is to get on and do the operation okay. and consider interoperative radiotherapy for that bed. Uh, put clips on the region afterwards so we can monitor that carefully and maybe use some more local treatment afterwards. Um, but, you know, I can see, looking at those MRIs again, you can see the uh, on the T2 images the fatty replacement and the bone marrow. So yeah. that actually gives you a very good idea as to where the radiotherapy was before. So I'm beginning to settle on surgery now and then um, interoperative radiotherapy and see where we are afterwards. Yeah. So you still, you, there is still... The, the anterior table of that sacrum is still clear. Your resection, yeah. you know, you're taking presacral fascia and down right the way down so onto it, exactly. onto bone with its, yeah. you know, coexisting. It might be all right. Morbidity. It may, yeah. you know, that that's still resectable. But I would want to resect with a plan as to how we were going to go further. So, you know, for me, if we were offering a surgery, it's a permanent colostomy and and ideally the use of a momentum to fill her pelvis to keep any small bowel out of the way. Yeah to then give you that area that any local radiotherapy of necessary was available. Mm. Well, I think the trouble with full fox theory, which you mentioned, is yeah. she's not tolerated mm. no, full fox, true. so yeah. adding in another I agent is very good. unlikely she's going to cope yes. with that. Um, and I, th I think the other thing with this lady is she's becoming less well, um, both physically and psychologically. Um, you know, the uncertainty, what she, what she was hoping for at the beginning was was sort of potentially slipping away. Um, she was very reticent about taking any decent analgesia. She wouldn't take anything more than paracetamol. Um, we talked to her about referring her to the community um, specialist care team to sort of manage her symptoms, and she saw that very much as a negative and um, as us, you know, sort of putting her into a palliative sort of setting. So she was quite difficult um, to, to manage what, what her needs were, you know, what her sort of physical symptoms and her... What's, in what way was she not tolerating the chemotherapy? Um, mm. I think, I think it was just that she, I think it was her bloods, was it? Oh, okay. I think it was her bloods that weren't, um, weren't good. Um, okay, so the, the feeling in the panel is that we should just get on and do the surgery. Yeah, mm. I think so. Is that the, uh, 
okay. So the tertiary centre have expediated her surgery by four weeks. Um, it's still a significant time away. There is talk about perhaps asking another tertiary centre whether they would uh, take this case on. What do the surgeons feel about that? So I, I would say that we have to act in the best interest of the patient. And if the, if the, if the delays are unacceptable in her treatment pathway and another centre for which she then has obviously gone through and met and gained confidence from her second opinion. I mean, I, in many ways, I would welcome second opinions in a case like this if there's, if there's, if there's doubt um, to allay or to support any decision making that she makes in terms of what is potentially very radical surgery. Um, and I think we have to be mindful that if we're going to <coughs> offer tertiary referral services, we have to be able to provide them in the timely manner necessary. Okay, she did struggle through uh, and complete her three cycles of chemotherapy. And um, she was still quite symptomatic despite being defunctioned. And obviously the worry was that the disease was escaping us. Um, and so as the date for surgery approached, she was um, re-scanned once again. So Bruce, let's have a so look at those the, scans. The CT still doesn't show uh, any metastatic disease. The MRI on the right was the one preceding and now this is the most current one and you can see that it's still a bulky tumour the um, the ascites that we had before is largely resolved and there has been some slight shrinkage of the tumour it still involves the posterior margin uh, with extramural vascular invasion and no nodal disease um, so TRG4 um, but uh, still YT3 um, C YN0 YV2 Okay, so this lady has now had a posterior exenteration sacrectomy. She's needed a right hemicolectomy and right ureteric resection with reimplantation and radical surgery. Uh, any other comments from the panel? We don't have the histology back at this stage, unfortunately. I, I think the key is the early communication with the tertiary centre, and also considering being open to all those those mm. various options. Mm. Okay. I, I just, I, I, I'm su slightly surprised at the sacrectomy. That must have been a fairly high sacrectomy for that tumour. And, and yet, although it's close to that margin, it's not necessarily involved in the bone. It doesn't look to be involving the, the no, cortex, and, does it? And, and, and with advice from spinal colleagues, you could, we could, the, maybe just the anterior cortex yeah. could have been taken away from that area of sacrum because yeah. um, there's considerable morbidity not from a sacrectomy as mm. well as mm. potential loss of motor function uh, to both limbs. So we'll have to see what the histology shows uh, in this case uh, in order to assess that more carefully. Yeah. Um, but from what we've heard, she's making a reasonably good post-operative recovery. And they tend to stay in for about three or four weeks. Okay, so we've got the key learning points for this case. Um, good relations and communication with the tertiary centre is absolutely key for good outcomes for your patient. Mm -hmm. And inherited colorectal cancer impacts on the management uh, of your patient in a wide variety of ways. So we're back in the ICINI Centre now to uh, discuss the lecture and the MDT case in more detail and also that lovely patient interview uh, which gave us an insight uh, into uh, an area of patient lives that sometimes us as surgeons and other clinicians uh, sometimes don't get a, uh, an insight into. I'm here with my colleague Professor Tan Aralamplam who's going to discuss things further with me. Welcome Tan once again. Thanks very much Greg. Um, what did you think of, the, of Claire Taylor's lecture, first of all? Well, I think this is um, part of cancer care, part of our job that um, sadly um, has not had enough focus. And, and Claire's lecture was just, um, it was an eye-opener, uh, it was humbling, uh, and actually 
that's the reason we treat our patients. Uh, so I, I thought it was it was just mm -hmm. an excellent lecture. It shows us that you know we've gone from you know the surgical technical aspect of what we do was, was part of this this the wedge in a pie uh, of the whole patient's care, uh, but actually she pointed out how important it is for the patient to be really involved. They're scared. They're vulnerable. They actually have different needs to and and, and, and desires to what we want in terms of treatment you know we're, we're very technically focused on the cancer so treating the patient as a whole is very very important which you know we, we need to do more um, we couldn't live without our CNS's now our patients couldn't live without them and it, 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 rem it sort of brings to mind Atul Gawande's book Being Mortal you know every surgeon should read that book uh, because it, it, it really hits home the message about actually um, uh, what does the patient look what what are the optics for the patient not for us uh, so yeah that's, uh, yeah I mean it, it, it hit hard for me actually I mean potentially as a surgeon now in the NHS modern busy NHS um, we could see our patient once preoperatively on the day of surgery during their stay in hospital and if things go well never see them again mm. and it um, it highlighted some of the, the, the outstanding work that goes on behind the scenes. And we think we know about those things, but in mm. fact, it takes someone like the CNS to sit down with the patient and take the time to go through all of the, not only the, the, the suggested treatments, but all the assessments, because we know diff different patients have different requirements and needs all the time. And that um, needs assessment is so important to the patient journey, not only assessing their physical needs, but their psychological needs as yeah. well. I think that came out in our MDT case as well, didn't it? When this poor lady ultimately had very successful surgical treatment, although it was pretty, pretty crippling and mutilating surgery, uh, ultimately she could well have been cured from that. But the, the wait for surgery as the tumour was growing on successive scans and uh, being offered a, a range of different opinions and treatments, and it absolutely terrifying for her. And, and that will live with her for the rest of her life, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, I can't agree with you more. Uh, I think the psychological aspect of surgery uh, for the patient is, is something that's very important. You know, we deal with these things every single day of our lives. And I think for the patient, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's a knockout blow. Um, so to have that advocate is very important. Uh, just some knowledge, some information, and actually having that information in a package that the patient can understand is, is crucial. Uh, living with uncertainty is it just drives anxiety through the roof. So, you know, um, I think the MDT highlighted that, uh, the MDT case highlighted that very well. And, um, you know, for us as surgeons, you know, we're responsible for our patients. And I think having the help of the CNS is in those circumstances to cover, you know, it's not just the psychology of it, but the um, family interactions, perhaps concerns about housing, um, work, um, finances. I, th I think it's, you know, so important. And they're, they're not questions that you or I could just have the set answers for. Mm. So I think having that time, having that point of contact, having a key worker is, is critical. I did like the fact that she said, we don't, we, we're going away from the survivorship because yeah. patients don't ever reach a point where they are a survivor. Yeah. Uh, they're relabeling that as living beyond cancer, which I yeah. think we thought was really good. And the other thing was uh, giving control back to the patient as one of their, their key aims. Because as, as Claire said, the patients are quite happy to give over control at the time of surgery when they're very vulnerable and they need uh, a specialist to treat them. But afterwards it's, it's very difficult to get that control back for patients sometimes. No, absolutely. So. Uh, and, and you know, you're quite right, it's a, it's a, it's a bend in the road um, uh, is what many CNSs describe this, this journey, mm. but then they're still on the road. Yeah. I wish I could have feedback, for, uh, just as uh, that patient interview gave, to all of my previous uh, patients. Yeah. But of course there's never going to be any time to do that, but it would be highly valuable for me to sit through that and, yeah. and see how they got on afterwards. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you once again. Thank Thanks you for much. coming. No, okay. Thank you. So we've seen some fascinating things discussed during this episode, and hopefully that will stimulate 
uh, some discussion and new ideas back in your hospital uh, as to how to improve the care that rectal cancer patients receive locally. Remember, if you'd like to get in touch with the Iceni Centre through any of the routes shown here, then please do so to give your feedback, and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Goodbye.